when I was with a group of friends in Brussels and uh, we were talking about doing a big show and I realized that I wanted to do one of the big Tchaikovsky ballets, Sleeping Beauty, Swan Lake, or The Nutcracker. And I realized that the, the music of The Nutcracker was so, so overly familiar to me and to all my dancer friends that I wanted to go back to it and find out why it was so beautiful and so moving and uh, why it drives you crazy. If you hear it so much, it gets stuck in your head. So I wanted to purge myself of that uh, connotation of the music and go back. And that's why I went back to the E.T.A. Hoffman story and why I really included every note of music and tried to make uh, from the ground up a fresh production of this piece. In 1990, Mark Morris began work on his version of Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker, taking inspiration from the comic book artist Charles Burns, whose work is deeply instilled with archetypal concepts of guilt, childhood, mystery, adolescent sexuality, and poignant portrayals of post-war America. Believe it or not, my first notion of a collaborator, a chief collaborator, was uh, Edward Gorey, the very great illustrator and writer uh, and friend of New York City Ballet. He'd, I really, I'd learned that he'd been to a lot of my performances. I love his work so much. And he was alive at the time, I could have asked him, but I realized that I wanted something newer, someone who was more my generation, and so I ended up thinking long and hard about the beautiful and upsetting comic books and uh, graphic novels of Charles Burns. He seemed to be the exact person to get sort of the, the period of this, the zeitgeist, someone to design the overall production that would really suit my personality. Morris turned to Adrian LaBelle to design sets that would take the tale out of the ballet's traditional German setting and into Burns' graphic black and white view of the world. With these sets, lighting designer James F. Ingalls created a dark 1970s American suburbia. Costume designer Martin Pacladinez envisioned costumes that also typified Burns' world, which has been described as being at the juncture of fiction and memory of cheap thrills and horror. Everybody had great ideas and crazy ideas. We rejected a lot of things. In thinking of the party, we were gonna have food at first. And Charles proposed the brilliant idea of Dr. Stahlbaum coming out with a huge roast turkey ready to carve and then have the whole thing fall on the floor, which has happened before. Um, and we were gonna have snacks and food and candies and everything like that and realized, first of all, that that was too much work to have that many props. And then we thought it would be more sort of bleak to only have drinks. So the only available uh, refreshment is alcoholic beverages. So there's nothing for the children. There's no food. It's just one drink after another. The last of 10 pieces Mark Morris choreographed during his tenure as director of dance at the National Opera House of Belgium. The Hard Nut was his most ambitious work to date. It called for 33 dancers with a total of 93 costume changes, a wardrobe and makeup crew of 21, and over 60 set pieces and props, including 20 pounds of confetti per show for the Waltz of the Snowflakes, all managed by a stage crew of 48. Along with an orchestra of 77 musicians and a choir of 12 singers, it took nearly 200 people to realize the massive production. The Hard Nut premiered on January 12, 1991 at the Teatro Royal de la Monnaie in Brussels, just shy of the 100th anniversary of the first performance of Tchaikovsky's classic score. Tell Tchaikovsky the news. It's not your average nutcracker. It's the Hard Nut. Film remains one of only two versions of the ballet to have been nominated for an Emmy. The party itself was the 
was the first thing I choreographed and it was high summer. We were in Brussels, it was very hot. And I assigned couples and I put on the music for act one and said, go, have a party, have a Christmas party. You know, it was July or something. And everyone's in their coats and pretending it's snowing. And we improvised it for weeks and really a lot of it remains to this day uh, open. There are many choices people have. They can. It's not exactly free improvisation, but it is wide open. When different people come in to the to the roles, when we change personnel, those people have to follow a track of where to go and what has to happen. But how you get there and how you uh, interact with your partner and the other people at the party is very open. There are many surprises in every performance. Over 100 dancers have danced in the hard nut with core company members taking on the roles in Act One's party scene. Cast members have come and gone. Some have returned after time away. Some have never left. In all, from 1991 through the 2006 production, The Hard Nut has been performed 150 times, seen by audiences at the Brooklyn Academy of Music in New York at the Edinburgh International Festival in Scotland, at Cal Performances in Berkeley, California, at London's Sadler's Wells Theatre, and in Annandale and Hudson, New York, at the Fisher Center for the Performing Arts at Bard College. Very often, someone's cover, someone's understudy for a part is of the opposite sex, and a lot of that doesn't matter. Mrs. Stahlbaum is played by a man, and you would be surprised how many people don't know that, which is a tribute to the actors who, who dance that part. The topic of the snowflakes and uh, the flowers uh, is an interesting one because, I guess because traditionally in most nutcrackers, those are danced by women because women are more like flowers or snowflakes. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, flowers have different genders very often. There's a male and a female flower. Snowflakes, I don't realize, I don't believe have sexual characteristics of any kind. Um, so what I wanted really frankly was a stage full of people. And my company is is 50% men and 50% women. So if I want a big crowd of people, I, it can only be that big if it's everybody. And so, you know, that became a political, socio-political thing when in fact it's just bring on the snowflakes. It was in my mind from when I was probably 14, 15 years old to choreograph uh, the Nutcracker. I heard the music for the first time, I heard it all the way through and deciding that I actually wanted someday to compose a dance to the entire score. So that's what I ended up doing. The San Francisco Chronicle recently wrote, proof of genius, the ability to create a new old chestnut. The vision of classical ballet that informed the original Nutcracker is well replaced here by a point of view that works for us in a new century, a little cynical, a little romantic, and very funny. Now a classic, The Hard Nut is a production that audiences have come not only to adore, but also to respect.